Thank you, Daniel. Um, and thanks everybody for uh, joining this, uh, this session. It's been, it's been a year since our last conversation on uh, some of the topics we're going to be uh, approaching here today. Uh, I am joined by Rodolfo Quijano, uh, Pedro Lopez uh, Belmonte, uh, Gahans uh, Ostenod, and Matthew Van Newkirk, and I hope I have pronounced all your names correctly. Um, it's always a challenge with the, the last Thank names. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks for joining us. And uh, let's start with a quick introduction. As, as we talked before, I'm going to be following the, the, the clockwise pattern of what I have here on my screen. And I just realized that pattern changed. Uh, so I have Rodolfo uh, starting, then I have Pedro, Gans, and, and then Matt uh, last. Uh, so let's start with an introduction, a uh, quick introduction of each of you, uh, starting with Rodolfo and then going to Pedro, uh, Hans and, uh, and Matt. All right. Thanks, Alberto. So yeah, as you said, the, the order changed, uh, but myself, I haven't changed since last year. Uh, I'm still working at Henkel. So for those of you who don't know Henkel, it's a German-based company that's uh, doing more or less 50% revenue in fast-moving consumer goods. So in beauty care and laundry and home care. And uh, the other 50% of our revenue is in the industrial adhesives area. Um, so I'm the head of blockchain. I've been the head of blockchain now for almost three years. And as I said, uh, second time joiner of this panel. Thank you, Pedro. Yes, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, Pedro Lopez Belmonte, uh, and I work for Rismo International. Uh, for uh, many of you, uh, Rismon might be uh, not very well known as the company uh, is not promoting, uh, is not doing a lot of uh, marketing uh, themselves uh, or ourselves. Uh, but uh, uh, Rismon is the second luxury conglomerate in the in the world with brands uh, as iconic as uh, such as uh, Cartier, Montblanc, IWC, Panerai, or uh, Vacheron Constantin. Uh, quite focused on uh, on watchmaking, but not only. Um, and uh, myself, I'm the blockchain tech lead uh, at the company. Uh, I work uh, in close relationships with uh, the brands and the innovation team in uh, all the blockchain initiatives. And uh, I'm doing this, uh, working in the blockchain space, uh, personally uh, a bit more, but at the company since uh, almost three years. Great, thank you. Uh, Gahans? Gahans Osterno, nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm working for Carrefour, retailer in France, but also nine countries in the world. We are retailing food products mainly, but also non-food and having some services. I'm head of uh, merchandising and supply chain B2B uh, platforms for Global City of Carrefour now. And I was handling the blockchain program since uh, 2018 for traceability mainly. Thank you, Gahans. Your turn. Yes, hi, uh, I'm Matthew. I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO of a company called Settlement. Uh, Settlement is a blockchain platform as a service uh, solution. Uh, we started in 2016, uh, myself in the blockchain space since around 2014. Uh, in a previous life before starting Settlement, I was a banker um, and leading a, a blockchain or supporting a blockchain center of excellence focused on uh, capital markets applications. But after 10 years in the banking sector, I did my time uh, and decided to uh, start Settlement uh, to make um, blockchain technologies more accessible for developers. All right. All right. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. There's, There's some, some feedback <laughs> from some of you. So if you're not speaking, if you could put your phones on, on mute. Um, thank you so much for the introductions and uh, let's start, uh, I'd like to start with a first question uh, to, to Rodolfo, uh, you know, we start with, uh, uh, you know, the title of the session on where have you been, uh, let's start with uh, what changed in blockchain uh, from, from last year, from our last talk and the last event, uh, it looks like it's been 10 years, COVID makes everything look so, so much longer. But uh, what do you think changed uh, in, in this one year and uh, what happened to blockchain? 
Yeah, I think I uh, I would say there's from a, let's say overall market perspective, I think we've gone through a couple of newer waves of hype, so to speak. I think there was a, a discussion earlier in the EBC about NTFs and things like that, which is I think on everybody's mind the last couple of weeks, uh, which I think always comes, uh, at least for us working in corporates, always comes sideways into the discussion of, oh, now maybe we should once again look into blockchain and see why it's so cool. Um, I think overall in the market, I've, what I've seen is a lot of other, as you said, uh, platforms coming in. So smaller players, bigger players trying to position themselves in the area of how they can provide uh, better services to the uh, to those of us uh, trying to leverage uh, blockchain as a whole. Uh, that would be at least my two takeaways from the last, as you said, COVID year. Um, more on the Henkel perspective, I think we've uh, finished well last year in regards to where we wanted to be a, in our process of, of trying to make sure that those um, that we had already proof of concepts and pilots where we could say, yes, we can take them productive. I, I think there, I think the only challenge is, uh, and I think we might uh, touch upon that later on in the panel is, is how to go productive, right? I think now we're facing scale, scale uh, topics, especially in regards to how do you grow your ecosystem that started very minimum at a minimum level uh, to something that's really providing, let's say, uh, value and return on investment of the approaches. You're also finding, let's say, vendors who drop out all of a sudden, and they said, well, uh, you know, uh, maybe the left way was not the right way to go. So maybe a little bit of the start of consolidation in the market, I don't know. Um, but yes, so now we're all kind of dealing in the challenges of scaling up what we had maybe presented last time around. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Pedro. You're, you're on mute, Pedro. Yes, yes, I realize that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes, I have a similar uh, point of view as uh, as uh, Rodolfo. So uh, in uh, in one year, um, I think, uh, in, in my opinion, the most remarkable thing is that uh, I, I see uh, again the 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 wheel moving in terms of uh, of uh, DeFi. I think. Uh, it's moving quite a lot uh, and they are quite uh, active with uh, a lot of things. In terms of non-DeFi, uh, maybe since uh, the last uh, year and a half, I've seen uh, the, 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 the conversation like slowing down. And I think now the trends start to, uh, to um, build up again, probably partially, partially due to the, to the NFT uh, fever that uh, we are living uh, these days. Uh, but uh, yes, I think I think uh, it's uh, very interesting because I have also the same uh, feeling that uh, the the dust is starting to settle. Um, the some some of uh, the partners uh, that we were seeing in the in the ecosystem uh, uh, a couple of years ago they are not uh, anymore, and the ones that uh, are still here they have consolidated. They, we can see that they are starting to uh, to grow. And from a corporate perspective, uh, and uh, you know, looking at our projects uh, is the same. They are growing. We are industrializing our our uh, some of our projects, uh, and and we see uh, uh, much more interest uh, inside and outside. Uh, and uh, if I have to summarize, I would say that uh, blockchain is uh, maturing in the last uh, has matured a bit in the last year. Great, uh, Garans. Yes, I, I agree with with both of you. Uh, sanitary crisis um, showed the importance of focusing on our values, and in Carrefour, uh, we have this uh, this motto to be uh, the leader for tra transition, providing uh, good products to all of our consumer. Um, I guess the public um, realized that things that were taken for granted were not that easy. Supplying um, food in the stores was not easy. So we had to focus uh, on the core business. But we also had in the equation um, price and sustainability of the products we deliver. So we focused on that. We keep our blockchain program on food transition and food traceability to provide this quality information. We focus on what really matters to maintain a good price. And now the crisis is, we hope, 
uh, passing, we are trying to address new use cases right now, maturing, as you said. Thank you, guys. And I'll uh, pick up, I think, uh, just maybe underscoring a couple of things that have already said. Um, I, I'm, uh, Gartner does uh, surveys every year about um, the percentage of uh, POCs and, and research activities that are going into production. And uh, the study for 2019 and, 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 and 2020, now you see quite an evolution in, in the, the move from production, uh, sorry, from uh, POCs or research activities into production. And so 2019, the number was 5%, uh, so very low, the number of um, POCs that would go into production. Uh, same study in 2020 showed that um, around 14% um, uh, went into production. Uh, so a 3x increase in the, the propensity to move to production is, is impressive for one year one year evolution. And 2021, I expect it's going to be around 20, 24%. So I think the trend is going to continue. Um, so I'm, I'm, let's say, ambitious or optimistic about uh, the move out of the lab and into production. I guess you know, I think a lot of companies are recognizing that you don't really prove the business case until you're using it in, produ in production. So if, if, and as the maturity of the technology is, in, is improving, is getting better and um, it's ready for production use. So we're seeing that move out of the lab and into, uh, into production where blockchain starts to deliver real value. Um, and I think the other, the ESG theme is, is really accelerating within um, with everything I would say, but uh, we do see a lot, um, uh, let's say Q, Q3, Q4 last year and, and into this year, that a lot of um, um, organizations that we're talking to, um, whereas before they might have been focusing on you know new gener new revenue generation and and uh, or cost savings, um, ESG is really coming onto the forefront as as a driver for providing uh, not just being able to to have um, sustainable practices or uh, and things like that, but to be able to provide evidence of that uh, to be able to prove it immutably and uh, like uh, ir ir irrefutably that uh, you've achieved something from an ESG perspective is is where blockchain can add value. Last one uh, is move to public chain. Um, so I, I've seen uh, a shift as well. Uh, public chains and, and permissionless chains were kind of taboo, especially in the banking sector uh, previously. But uh, the, the uh, I, I start to see signs last year that uh, that that uh, fear, uh, if I can call it that, is is diminishing, and um, uh, companies are becoming more open to looking at uh, really decentralized uh, public blockchains. Amazing. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, you touched a few of the a few of the topics that I would like to discuss further uh, with you folks, like the POCs, also the the public versus the private uh, ledgers and blockchains. And uh, but but now the question we we talked about NFT. We talked about a a few of the things that have been happening in this last one year. Uh, is is there a trend at this point? Uh, can we trace better where blockchain is going, at least in the enterprise at this stage, Rodolfo? Um, on our perspective, uh, yes. We've also kind of narrowed down the areas of work we've been uh, doing, so to speak. I mean, we uh, uh, I wouldn't probably would not surprise anybody, but generally we're uh, focusing on the areas of supply chain and in, and sustainability as well. So this is, I mean, something I also heard from Garan says, is, despite the fact of all the chaos of the world, that we are still trying to do uh, responsible sourcing in, in that sense. And I think the consumers also have not lost any interest in that area. So, so there's still quite a demand uh, to go into the, look into your raw materials, into your, uh, let's say, upstream supply chain partners and make sure things are going well. <laughs> well what, what is your view, Pedro, on that? Where is blockchain uh, going for Richmond? Well, uh, on our side, uh, we we had a, a first exploratory uh, phase uh, where one of the things we did was to think, uh, okay, what do we do upstream, downstream, uh, uh, public, uh, private, uh, and we explored a bit, we analyzed a bit. Um, we bet early on in general uh, for the public uh, blockchain. And for the downstream especially, I think uh, it makes all the sense. Uh, as soon as you are going to uh, create a relationship with the customers and enhance it with uh, blockchain, it, it it does make sense to do it in a public way because uh, it, it, it's coherent with the transparency and uh, it follows uh, 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 a kind of uh, coherent uh, line or, or we want to uh, to call it uh, the, the the whole story makes sense, right? It doesn't make sense to use blockchain and to tell your customer this is your uh, certificate, your NFT, or whatever you are providing, but you cannot check it by yourself. 
Um, we also in the supply chain part, uh, we 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 uh, analyzed a bit, and where while we see a lot of value in our case, uh, we thought that blockchain was uh, not enough, uh, and uh, as it's not enough in most of the cases, that's probably one of the mistake of uh, people entering into the world. They 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 say, or they think that blockchain is the 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 golden ticket or the magic one to solve all the problems. It's just, it's just a part of the piece and you need to be smart of how to implement it. And in our case, we saw that we we were in the right um, in the right track, but we needed to strengthen our supply chain and our relationship with uh, with our providers before really putting something uh, with uh, doing something with blockchain in that regard. So I think uh, for us, that's uh, our future. Uh, short, medium, long term, I don't know, but uh, we will get there. Okay, and for for Carrefour, uh, Gamas? Um, for Carrefour, we rely on a private blockchain. We decided because we know all the suppliers forming the 37 consortium we have live now. Um, we decided to have a private blockchain to secure it, but also to reduce energetic cost and maintain an uh, eco tech because it's one of the concerns when we talk about blockchain is to have uh, uh, an energetic cost important. So we had this, um, this solution, but we opened it to the consumer using a single, a single page internet. We are exposing the data in the blockchain through an API to the final consumer. So we are dealing with this problem another way. It's good. It could be inspiring. Maybe in other use cases, as I said, in supply chain use cases, we will have to address a public blockchain. However, in, in our future, we are, um, it, it's a, a, a near future because it's this month, we are exploring interoperability with our blockchain and other blockchain um, to, to see if uh, through standard APIs, we can share data and evo avoid uh, rewriting, reloading uh, of data. And we are quite confident it will uh, work because we were based on standard of data. But that's uh, an important thing for us to maintain these standards and make sure we can have a secured but open system. Um, that's an issue. And if we see uh, a, a, a more long-term future, if we have more actors in the blockchain area, we will have to maintain to mature uh, blockchain and maybe anticipate some risk and some attack uh, on the blockchain. Great, Matt. Yeah, and I, I think I think I, I maybe in the previous question I talked a little bit about future trends, but I'll, uh, there's one that I think uh, Garance mentions uh, one that's really important that standards. Um, uh, the, let's say the if I look at the example of trade finance and what's happened in that over the past starting in 2015 already, and you had. Uh, in, in, in the financial services sector, the, the enthusiasm about doing things of blockchain technology and trade finance. And the result, uh, you know, three, four years later is that we have, um, uh, let's say 15 or 20 prominent uh, trade finance consortia that are operating across the world. And, uh, the, and they're, they're all separate islands. Um, so you have uh, different trade finance solutions that are operating on chain using, you know, uh, either using uh, enterprise Ethereum or using Corda or using Fabric, whatever uh, protocol they selected. But now from, from a, um, uh, a user perspective, that's not a financial institution that actually would look to, you know, getting a, a seamless journey for a ship going across all of these different islands of trade finance is, is not optimal. Um, so it, it's kind of highlighting the need to create solutions for interoperability, and, and that's the core to that is, is standard. So uh, other things like ISO and, and W3C, uh, standards for decentralized identities and, and the Decentralized Identity Foundation, I think we're going to see a continuance. And I guess in the, in the early days, it was just, you know, leave standards out because let us innovate, you know, standards kill innovation. I think that that kind of a phase where we'll start to emerge from and um, in the next couple of years, it'll be a big focus on having clear standards that uh, enable interoperation between different blockchains because we're not going to end up with one blockchain. Uh, we'll, we'll live in a multi-blockchain future and uh, that will require standards and interoperability. 
Thank you. There's uh, two questions from the audience here that I'd like to get addressed. Uh, one of them, I think it's uh, faster to for Garance uh, to uh, to answer. Uh, and is there any solution developed at Carrefour today where you can have information of a product with QR code plus blockchain? And uh, I'll let you answer and I'll complement the answer because uh, we are involved in some of that as well. Um, any solution? Uh, I don't really Where you can uh, scan a QR code and you, you uh, can, trace through the blockchain. It depends on the country you're in. Uh, in France, you can go for uh, any stores looking for careful quality line products. And if you're buying a chicken and some eggs, some oranges, some tomatoes this summer because it's seasonal products, so you don't have them for now. Um, cheese, you have uh, Camembert, you have Rocamado, you have Chavignol, you have several products. And since the beginning of the year, you can also buy textile organic product. You can have uh, bed linen sheets. You can have also uh, baby bodies um, if, you, if you have some kids. Uh, that's a range of products in, in France. If you're in other countries, you have uh, equivalent uh, chickens in Carrefour Quality Line brand, there are almost a blockchain in all our country. Eggs, mostly. Some countries have uh, put some blockchain on pork, on fishes like um, merlots or salmon. Uh, we have a range of products, and, and as I said, we have now uh, 37 products. We can um, I can put some, some URL in the chat so, so you can have a look, for instance, on, on one chicken. Um, but I don't, you have, you know, have I don't know if the audience has access to the same chat that we do. Uh, okay. I'll double check with Daniel <laughs> later. But what we'll do is uh, we'll try to share some of these links with the audience yeah. uh, so they can have access to, to yeah, this. And, and I can complement on that because we have some products. Nestle has some products. Yeah. There's trace on the blockchain. They're sold by Carrefour. Yeah. And there is a QR code and you can scan and uh, you can get the... Uh, the supply chain information in there. Oh, Daniel exactly. just said he will share the link with uh, that you put on the chat. He would share with the. Uh, oh, there you go, a beer. <laughs> yeah, it was a uh, actually this this was one so QR code. There's I, I sorry I ran off for a moment and they probably heard some noise of beer bottles clanking. Uh, but it was, I wanted to show. I'm, I'm glad the, you came prepared for the panel. Yes. <laughs> You're ready. I'm drinking That's coffee like here. I feel yeah. <laughs> But it's the end of the day in Europe, so it's the beginning of the day for me. And the other question we have from the audience for Pedro, uh, has uh, Richmond explored the possibility of merging luxury brands with video games using blockchain technology or <laughs> NFT? That's, that's an interesting one. Well, I, I would say that, uh, that um, first, uh, the, uh, there is a lot of hype uh, now about NFTs. And uh, I would say that not all NFTs are built uh, the same. Uh, I think the hype now is focusing more on collectibles. Uh, we have been uh, applying NFTs and creating NFTs uh, since uh, two years, uh, since the past two years, for more focusing on authentication uh, and on ownership, right? Which is a bit linked to, to, uh, to the question, because in the end, um, what uh, you need in order to, to um, put something on a virtual realm, like a video game, is, is uh, to, to, to at least guarantee the ownership of the, of the item. And uh, certainly it's uh, on, on our uh, bucket of uh, ideas. I couldn't say right now if, uh, if uh, we will go sooner or later or ever, but uh, I think... Uh, my personal opinion, not my uh, company man opinion, my personal opinion is that uh, we will go sooner or uh, later. And when I say will, it's not only Rismo, it's all the industry, because certainly there is uh, a lot of value there. And I think is the right way, or not the, but one of the right ways to merge uh, the, the current um, uh, use of uh, NFTs as collectibles with uh, the usage that the industry has explored first uh, in the shape of uh, ownership uh, certificates or tokens uh, back to, to products. So uh, why not to imagine a, a virtual version of, uh, of uh, the product 
um, mm. just going into some video game, right? I'm, I'm, I'm an avid gamer myself. Uh, so uh, I, I would personally even like to, uh, to see something of that. It would be pretty cool to have uh, one of your watches uh, in Fortnite, huh? Indeed, uh, there are a lot of games in Fortnite, uh, mm. and, or, or in, in in different games as well. Uh, I, I I would say that any online game right now should be susceptible to uh, to have uh, this kind of uh, this kind of application. Uh, another thing is that uh, as a brand, you need to see where you want to go, what fits best uh, your strategy. But for me, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. when? Amazing. Um, Rodolfo, we, we have been talking here, some of the talks we talk about, like different use of blockchains, there's a private, there's public, uh, permission-based, non-permission-based. Um, are there too many competing blockchains uh, solution today? What, what is the ideal number? In the market, have you have you thought about that? Uh, no, not really. I think, uh, I think, yeah. I mean, from from my perspective, I think we had kind of some similar discussions uh, in one of our projects, which ran into some challenges uh, because we were quite uh, happy with the initial, for example, blockchain framework we uh, decided for. Um, and they're basically, I think, the uh, from a corporate perspective, you're still quite zeroed in on these private blockchains. So, I mean, I, uh, kind of kudos to to Pedro and those who are uh, who are able to use uh, the public block blockchains and get uh, partners on board for that uh, perspective. Uh, but for us, it's really a, really a no go. So, so it does reduce a little bit the the universe of, of frameworks. Um, and, and even then you still have questions about, you know, uh, so maybe what, what about Corda or R3 and things like that. Um, I think from my perspective, at least during the last six to nine months, it's more of a topic of how many vendors out, are out there. I think if, if I were to say today that I have a project and some budget to run a traceability project with blockchain here at the con convention, I'm sure I will have 100 or 200, even thousands of, of emails from companies who are specializing in this. Uh, so it's getting quite, I would still still, this is an area where I would say, yes, it's quite muddled. Um, and the most startups and big companies are searing in also on these uh, use cases that are much common. I would say also probably anti-counterfeit. Uh, logistics tracking, you some, Matt, I think you mentioned shipping. That's also an area where there's plenty of, of things to go around. So it's, it's getting quite difficult to pick out the good ones from the bad ones. <laughs> um, Pedro, uh, what, what about you uh, on, on, on the same topic? Uh, you know, and, and I think in, in one of our previous conversations, you did mention that you started with one ledger, if I'm not mistaken, with Swisscom. And then uh, you switch to another one. How many ledgers you're working with today, and how many different solutions, and where you see the market going? No, oh, we did we did a, a project, uh, a proof of concept with uh, with uh, Swisscom and our brand Panerai. It's not very well known, but it was public uh, when, when we did it, and it was at the same time uh, as we started the project with uh, Bachelot Constantin and uh, Ariane. So uh, Vachon Constantin is uh, another one of our brands. Uh, the project is live today and, uh, and, um, and uh, in the process of being industrialized. Uh, so going to moving into a full production uh, mode. And um, we decided to take different approaches for, for both of them. With uh, Vachon, we went with, uh, with a startup uh, very focused on the use case. Uh, Ariane, which uh, was also uh, setting up setting up a, a consortium, an industry consortium, which is was also very interesting for us, um, and uh, based on uh, on uh, an Ethereum side chain, right? Uh, it's public side chain and uh, and um, yeah, working with uh, Ethereum technology, which uh, for us was uh, important. Um, and I will get back to that uh, in a minute uh, because it's linked to uh, one of the topics that Matthew said before. Uh, the other project uh, was with uh, Swisscom and, uh, and Panerai. Uh, with Panerai, we decided to take a similar approach, but with uh, more a traditional Swisscom blockchain. Uh, they are really great guys. They did a great project, but it's not a focused. Uh, uh, startups such as uh, Ariane, they are more uh, generic and they are doing different projects. I'm quite 
successfully. Uh, they did a very good project for us uh, on top of uh, Hyperledger fabric, right? So private blockchain and 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 we uh, after comparing the two projects, we learned a lot and we realized that uh, in that particular use case, the the right way for uh, for us to go was uh, the public blockchain because uh, the, the first it's a bit more agile. Uh, second, you have the, the value of the consortium, which is very important for us. Otherwise, we would be uh, building our own uh, blockchain or maybe not even a blockchain, maybe a, a database would be uh, more than enough. And uh, and uh, we realized also that uh, that um, yeah, having having uh, the, the Ethereum layer is providing um, uh, some standards to us. And we realize on the, on the standard point, uh, I wanted to point out that I think they are very important. And I also agree that the standard might kill a bit uh, the innovation. So what's the approach that we took? We said, okay, we need a standard today. Uh, so we choose a standard, uh, Ethereum, uh, because it's the standard today. Is what everyone is uh, using for fungible and non-fungible tokens. But we keep an open mind in the future. So, uh, really, we are uh, ready to move. If uh, tomorrow mm -hmm. another blockchain uh, will arise that uh, will replace Ethereum as uh, as a standard, or where we see more value for for us and for our customers in uh, in this use case, uh, we are ready to move, and we will move uh, as quickly as uh, as, I, as we can. Why I have you on the spotlight, Pedro? Uh, someone asked about uh, a partnering, uh, Richmond partnering uh, with uh, Ariane, uh, yeah. and uh, what does it bring to Richmond? Uh, what are the incentives for that, and what does it bring to Richmond? As I said, it's the consortium, and it's the fact that they are uh, a, a startup uh, also focused on our sector. So they are focused on on certifying luxury goods. And uh, in the process of creating the, the project, uh, the, the interaction was very good, at a very good level between both parties. Uh, so uh, the, the, our Maison, Vacheron Constantin, uh, they had a pretty good idea, but uh, that was enriched uh, with, uh, with uh, the inputs from uh, Ariane. And I think we created something uh, very good, which was the core of, uh, of uh, what, what Ariane is today. Uh, we 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 built. Uh, we helped them build the the, the consortium and, and and the focus of the application uh, together, and uh, that's what I say. Uh, the incentive for us is that they are providing a lot of value. They have been able to uh, get on the same table different players in the in the industry, and these conversations with uh, our competitors around this uh, specific use case, I think is enriching. And it's enriching each one of us because we share different point of view, we share different perspective, uh, and, and we are able to um, gather around a common objective with the added value that then uh, we have the flexibility to uh, move ourselves the way we want with the solution uh, because again, is an open source uh, protocol. So we can enrich each, each one of us can enrich that solution with our own uh, flows, with our own uh, specifications, and with our own ideas or services for the customers. Interesting. And you you touched the point of uh, you know the really the network and the framework. I think Rodolfo touched on that point as well, which is uh, critical for blockchain when we talk about using different uh, ledgers. Uh, yep. It's not necessarily about ledger A or B or C, but what are the interconnection possibilities of that because blockchain is about uh, distributed. For uh, on still on the same topic for Garance, uh, there is a, a question here that uh, someone raised on Kahefu maintaining both its own blockchain and IBM uh, Food Trust usage. Can you uh, share a little bit more on that and also your views on you know the multiple blockchains uh, available out there and what is what is the role for Kahefu? Um, we, we do maintain uh, both platform, our own made uh, platform and, and, and IFT's platform. Uh, we, we had uh, an inverse move from yours, Pedro. Uh, we started with Ethereum in 2017 and we moved to uh, Hyperledger Fabric in 2018 because at this time it was more suitable for our purpose. 
So everything is changing. The, the technology is maturing, but it's still young. We do not know what the, the future is made of. So it's important to stay flexible and, and keep this ability to, to adapt. Um, what's interesting for us is uh, both our platform, uh, Carrefour and IFT, are based on um, hyperledger fabric. We are trying to, to maintain some standards, even if we have some uh, different innovation in one platform, we can do some stuff in one platform, we cannot do on the second one, but that's no big deal because we try to adapt to our uh, consumer need and it's not blockchain for blockchain, it's blockchain for purpose. And if the purpose is changing, the blockchain is changing. What can be interesting, it's not, uh, I totally agree, it's not a, a, a question of quantity of actors, it's more a question of quality of the actors, of quality of the protocol, uh, quality of the exchanges. Um, we can have proprietary platforms as we have with CAFO, but it's an open one, able to communicate with our IFT platform. And that's interesting uh, to, to maintain blockchain live in the future. So th that could be my, my point of view for, for, for the maturity of the, of the system and the number of factors. Competency is good. If we can have good competency trying to improve quality and reduce price, it will be all benefit for all of us and mainly for us, for our consumer. Because if we just have 37 uh, use cases for now, it's because of the cost of the blockchain. Carrefour is paying for it. It's not the supplier paying for the blockchain. It's not the consumer. So it's ourselves maintaining our business model. If it's cheaper, we can offer this transparency and the traceability to more product, meaning more consumers. And that's a good thing. Thank you. Uh, Matt, uh, you talked a little bit on, you know, the, the, the different uh, ledgers and blockchains. What's your view on that and uh, where you see this, this going? Are we going to have a blockchain to rule them all or uh, we're going to focus more on, on standardizing data across the ledgers? Yeah, and and from with us as a as a product company, you know, our approach is to stay agnostic. Um, so we, all of the 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 different the leading enterprise blockchain protocols are all supported by the platform. So yeah, if if it was you know let let's try it with this technology, and then tomorrow let's try it with that one, uh, and then the day after or next week we say, well, it didn't really work with that protocol. Let's try it with uh, this other one. Uh, that's all possible. So we we don't think that. It makes sense to lock any anyone to a specific protocol um, because it, the simple matter is, or the simple fact is that there's not one blockchain that's best for everything. And um, so we, we try to stay agnostic to, to protocols and we've added in also the last year, the, the, the mainnet for Ethereum and uh, evaluating three other public uh, uh, blockchain uh, protocols at, at the moment. Um, so there's, you know, we, we want to stay uh, flexible so that uh, providing optionality to users of our platform. Um, so if, if something changes and it's not compatible with the use case, the business, the, the business changes or the needs change, then, okay, well, I don't need to throw everything out. I can uh, keep using the same thing. Um, so, and, so the first part is we stay agnostic. Um, and the second part, uh, so do we, uh, do I think there'll be a blockchain? Well, I guess the first part probably answers the second part. Uh, short answer is no, I don't think there'll be one blockchain that rules them all. Um, and what we do with our technology, we have um, a layer in it uh, for that can support interoperability between chains. Um, so using the, the kind of a, a cross-chain pegging mechanism uh, that uh, enables for information to be ported. And then to the final part, an answer to the, the answer to the final part, it's, it, it'll be more about then uh, standardizing data formats than uh, trying to force everything into one, one size fits all blockchain. The other question from the audience for you, if people got interested in your beer, um, <laughs> if, uh, if there is any way you can actually uh, show how this uh, QR <laughs> code uh, of the beer work. I don't know if you can show it here on the screen maybe, or, the other thing I was going to suggest you, if you can take a picture of that QR code and uh, paste it on the chat. There we go. Let's see if we can read that. So when I when I scan that QR code, I'm taken to yeah. a website from from Leffa, and there I can um, yeah I can do all kinds of stuff to engage right. with the consumer. They show recipes, uh, but when I want to see the provenance of the the beer itself, 
um, I click on you know, show, show me the journey. And when I do that, uh, it just takes a second. It's coming up. Um, so I can see. I can here, see it now. We can see it now. Yeah. There's the farmer, uh, farmer uh, Louis Joffre from, uh, from the wow. north of France. Um, and if I want to see how did this, this, what was the journey of the beer before I got it in my, my shelf, all of the, the data throughout the supply chain is collected. Um, and then I can at the end, oops, sorry, went through it. Okay. And that was when I get, when it was bottled at the, the bottling plant. And uh, then it was shipped to, uh, to the, the warehouse and to the, uh, to the, to the shop. So th this one went live in January um, and it was the North of France. So the macro store, 6 million bottles of Leffa um, with that QR code. Um, there's, so each, each, uh, you scan that. May I, can yeah. I make a suggestion? Yeah, because probably not all audience has access to, to that beer uh, in their different uh, countries. If you could share a picture of that QR code and put on the chat, yep. uh, then uh, Daniel can post this to, to the audience to try it at home. That will yep. be, be interesting. And, um, and then what I will do as well is uh, I will share following this, uh, this panel, I'll share with Daniel a few QR codes from Nestle products as well. So people can get more familiar on how this traceability, perhaps the hands you can do on uh, from uh, get some products from Kahefu as well and uh, people can trace. And, and next year, when we're we have this uh, live and in person, we'll share not just the QR codes but the products as well. That we'll, we'll drink the beer. <laughs> that, that that will be awesome. I'm looking forward for that. Um, Rodolfo, we've we've been talking. Uh, you know, part of our conversation has to do with uh, you know we're talking about pox. We're validating. We're testing. We're trying, and we keep hearing about pox for for a while now. It's been almost two years. Uh, what is pox, and what is reality? And connecting with another question from uh, from the audience is how high is the priority of blockchain uh, for product traceability in supply chain, and how high overall is blockchain in terms of priority for Henkel, for example? Uh, I think the first two are very good questions, as you said, in regards to the uh, the topic of the pox. Because I think I was following the discussions of, of, of Garantz, uh, Pedro, and, and Matt. As you said, if you're starting to talk about standards and interoperability, I think you're in a good stage. It means probably that your pucks made sense, they worked, and that they're looking now to, to, be, to expand and scale. Um, I think you keep hearing about pox because I think it takes a little while to get uh, into the sweet spot, uh, what we call it, of, of what a blockchain use case is really like. Uh, and what I mean is that you have kind of two, at least from us perspective, what we have found is that there are two variables you have to look at. One, of course, is the business benefit or the return on investment. Uh, so, and they're basically what you would find and even has happened to us that you start a POC in an area where you think it's very simple to do. Be there might be a lot of, uh, not a lot of friction going in. Maybe you already know the partners and whatever, but the, the return on investment that, or the problem that it solves is really minimal. So you might have a very successful POC. Technology has almost never been an issue for us. But then when you look at the topic for the Don't next investment, then you then you have a uh, you have to think okay so why isn't anybody coming in it's maybe not worthwhile to do it on this puck we should have done it maybe on a on a on a problem that brings you more rev more return on investment so to speak uh, and the second topic is sometimes you get that right and you say yes this is the area for example we want to trace materials on a supply chain perspective for our, for our perspective there's a lot of focus on the sustainability angle in that sense, and the, as, as, you, as uh, Matt showed on his app, there's quite a lot of also consumer value and upsell benefits that you can uh, quickly gain through that, uh, even if it's just through the marketing of the solution, but hopefully more because people actually scan it and look at it. Um, I, but then you figured out, hmm, you know what, I started off maybe a, maybe too small in my ecosystem. So now the issue is getting all the other members involved. So I think I also, I mean, uh, last year we had not Garantz, but Emmanuel uh, representing Carrefour. And, and for example, I think it's a very wise decision to start off with the Carrefour line of products because then they're able to scale their ecosystem quite quickly. Uh, and, and, and in that sense, for example, then that, that also helps you to grow, to have this high priority topic pushed the right way, a puck becoming a productive uh, scenario and, and then coming back to the end of the uh, 
of the question. So how high of a priority is for Henkel? I think it goes in line with the, the problems to solve. So if I looked at overall supply chain, maybe in the areas where we still have some challenges in tracing where our products are along the supply chain is, is a good area where it's still high on the agenda of people's list, uh, especially as it's consumer facing. So maybe the downstream side of the supply chain and the other area, as I said, is in sustainability because I think that's part of our core values at Henkel. I think we do also a pretty good job uh, from what we've learned in, 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 in working with our uh, sustainability stakeholders in the different lines of businesses. So it's something very important for us to can make sure that we can certify that we are working sustainably and that we can offer that into the consumers. Uh, for some of the other areas, as I said, we've had pucks where we said, hmm, we started maybe off on the wrong, uh, let's say on the very low value approach. So then yes, of course, the priorities also go down as, as you work with any innovation pipeline. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, for for Richmond, uh, Pedro, uh, how high in the priority list is blockchain? And uh, if you could assess today, what is uh, POC and what is reality uh, for Richmond? How much more reality versus POC you have today versus prioritization? I think uh, I think uh, we are in 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 the moment of uh, shifting, or or. To say it better, we started uh, one year ago in a moment of shifting. So uh, at the beginning of uh, last year, we realized that uh, the technology and, and the, the that was bringing us to uh, was bringing value to us, uh, and uh, that were our POCs were valid, and and uh, and we decided to uh, to move ahead. So I would say that uh, today. Even in the conversations that we have, uh, not only for the existing uh, uh, projects, but even for new projects, uh, we are having a, a really long-term uh, view inherent in all our conversations because we have already validated the, the, the technology. So now it's not a, a question of uh, if the technology is valid for us, it's, it's how we can apply it and if we are ready in in the different use cases to apply it uh, and, and and i go back to the sample as i mentioned before of our supply chain uh, that we saw we will it was not ready we were not ready in that side to um, include blockchain in our supply chain solution so i think that's the approach now we are ready we are moving we are more um, we have more and more interest and more and more initiatives and, and it's just a matter of uh, fitting the, the different pieces. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, I know you you have more reality than Pox at this stage because mm -hmm. you have the actual products out, but uh, yeah. do you see that shift and what is the priority uh, that you see uh, you know with, with your management uh, when it comes to blockchain? Um, well, actually, we have we are in real world for food and uh, and um, textile traceability. We made one pack in our rolls um, traceability. It was supporting the supply chain uh, trace, but we stopped that. Maybe we will relaunch some uh, studies in um, in the supply chain area. Um, so it's beginning with book and then it goes in reality world. Um, for food traceability, as I said, it's reality. The priority for us, um, now we are, we had a phase in reality world, uh, testing and learning. Uh, I, I shared the, the chicken um, QR code. If you look for another product, you will see some differences in the design, in the data we trace because we were trying some stuff. Uh, sometimes it was good, sometimes it was not the better idea. So we have uh, a little bit of diversity. Now we are reducing and re rationalizing on um, one unique design more or less. Um, that's the first thing. The second part is now the technology and the business understand what we're doing. We have to convince the consumer uh, they get some benefits because when you're shopping, you have a lot of messages, you have price, you have music, you have lights, you have, uh, is the time running? You have so many inter 
injunction in, in your mind when you're shopping that scanning a QR to, to, to get the traceability is not uh, easy for everyone and, and it's not the purpose. So we have to, to focus on customer uh, adoption first. Um, we have to explore now new use cases, maybe on supply chain, maybe on sustainability, maybe uh, both combined in supply chain and sustainability, but uh, focus uh, on customer adoption first. For the, the first use case we explored. Matt, uh, <laughs> you. Yeah, maybe just a, a little bit continuing on what uh, Gerans was uh, talking about. Like uh, what we're seeing now is uh, so we've done some things with uh, sustainability and and um, and supply chain. So the, I'm, I'm flashing this package of beer, and it seems like it's kind of a nice novel thing to to do. But uh, the, that implementation was fully driven by the sustainability department at ABM Bev. Um, so what they're they're looking to do is gather insights throughout the supply chain to identify. You know, they, they work with so many so many suppliers uh, of uh, at the farm level. Uh, I think there was something like fifty thousand farmers across Europe. Um, you know, production. Um, let's say output per. Um, uh, let's say ton of barley is different uh, depending on the farmer. So if they, what they want to do is collect information throughout the supply chain, not just at the farm level, but throughout it uh, to see in which ways can they share best practices amongst such a large group of suppliers uh, so that uh, the ecological footprint of the um, of the supply chain can be diminished. And I, I learned a lot about uh, the, the brewing process, but of course about the farming and agricultural side of things. Uh, metrics like how deep is the soil tilled uh, when they're planting uh, that has an impact on yield um, or you know what was the the angle of tilling all of these things apparently have impact on on output for a square or a, let's say a cubic um, ton of of of, uh, of of barley so the the aim there is 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 really about sustainability and um, what we're working on now is another use case where it's sustainability supply chain and financing uh, so how do you uh, creating yeah, supply chain finance solutions uh, where uh, either the uh, the purchaser, if they're large enough, that offers um, uh, financing solutions to their own suppliers, or financial institutions that get involved to provide working capital solutions for uh, for SMEs, for example, that are supplying large companies. But you know, so the crossover. What I find interesting is like you know, you start. We started with one thing, which was okay, supply chain tracking, and then sustainability is added to that as a driver. Uh, and then another thing being added on top, and you've got uh, you know financing uh, that's you know preferential on the financing side. It's you know giving um, incorporating ESG metrics into uh, the the credit scoring model, uh, so that you know if, if I'm if I'm factoring an invoice uh, as an SME, that um, you know if I have good scores and the goods that I'm producing are green, um, <clears throat> then I'll get um, uh, you know 90, 96 cents on the dollar for my invoice. Um, if I'm average, I'll get 94 cents. And if I'm, uh, my ESG scores are low and the product that I'm producing is, um, is uh, oil, I don't know, something like that, uh, then I get 92 cents on the dollar. So what I'm finding interesting here is like the combination of use cases that actually drive, um, uh, can drive adoption and, and create incentives throughout the ecosystem, um, whether it's a, an ESG incentive or it's a better financing incentive. But bringing more in, in growing the ecos the, the that consortia to involve different dimensions of business is is will lead to much more adoption. I think. Great, um, there's uh, I I like to see when I'm seeing here the questions from the audience. They're on fire. There's a ton of questions here. I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer all these questions uh, today, but we'll uh, during the the live session. But certainly we'll touch those uh, those those questions uh, later on. But uh, I'm going to try to connect a few of those here uh, to help us. Uh, there's people talking about, you know, do we have use case beyond tracking goods, right? And, and I think that's, uh, that's my view. It's, it's a common misconception that uh, people think that blockchain is about traceability. Traceability is one of the use cases, and perhaps it was the use case that was uh, like closer to blockchain. But blockchain is mostly about trust and to give transparency to trust. And, and, and that brings an additional value to the supply chain. Um, Rodolfo, how, how you see this? And, and do, you, do you have a, a similar concern when people think, well, it's only about supply chain, it's only about traceability. And what is the value of this traceability? I would say that I agree fully that it's about the three T's. So as you said, traceability, trust, transparency, definitely. Yeah. 
I think I would, however, not criticize anybody who is doing a traceability uh, exercise or who wants to start there. I think it's a, what do you call these low hanging fruits. So if you wanted to get started on your blockchain practice or really start seeing how that would work in your company, that's definitely an area where to go. As Matt said, yeah, right. You, then you combine it with different things, with financing, with, uh, I don't know, with audit uh, compliance or something else in that sense. Um, I, I think, as you said, it's... Um, the, I would somehow, because we explored quite a bit of, of the uh, different fields uh, when we started a couple of years ago, the one area where I think it might make sense to still look at, or maybe two areas, if I can try to keep my answer short here, uh, is still in the area, as you said, of, of, of financing and not necessarily of praying with crypto or things like that, but in the processes that have to do with payment to providers or to payment to customers in that sense, it's much, it's, they don't really care where the product is at. It's more about the flow of money and who has kind of, uh, who ha can provide, let's say, proof that something was uh, charged correctly, so to speak. Uh, there's quite a lot of money uh, in some of these processes for uh, money to be collected uh, because it's on dispute. And I think, uh, or promotions that are not, you know, that are not really uh, trustworthy <laughs> uh, from, from the different, let's say, uh, partners that you might have them. So that's an area that could be explored and it's definitely not about traceability. Uh, and I think the other area is about a little bit more on audit compliance, but I would maybe move it away from where uh, if, if my product crossed borders correctly to, to areas which are not explored, like for example, in human resources. So I could say today that I am a graduate of MIT and I might be able to uh, get something from, uh, from a, you know, a black market area to say that I am certified to, the, to do that. Uh, however, I think a solution like blockchain could definitely certify education. I think also for me coming from a, uh, a developing country, it was always, uh, I mean, it's not always that they know your university. Uh, so, so it would make it a very easy to say, hey, this is an existing university has a certain amount of prestige. This is the, uh, let's say, the, um, the valid certificate. So dear company, uh, multinational or whatever, uh, hire these kinds of people. And I think these are areas that, as I said, don't have anything to do with traceability, but do provide trust. And I think I said, they also provide transparency. Mm -hmm. That's the, the three T's. And uh, that's, that's, that's a way to, to connect with consumers as well, because that's what people are looking for, transparency and, and brands that they can trust. And I think that blockchain also connects uh, uh, the consumers with the smaller players because it, it levels the playing field. You know, you can uh, all of a sudden have have access to uh, to this uh, uh, list of, uh, you know, of transactions and who is buying from whom. And uh, can I trust this guy? Can I trust this other vendor, this other supplier? Uh, that uh, enables possibilities that people don't have today. And you also touched another topic that I'm particularly fond of uh, on blockchain, uh, which is the part of contracts. So not necessarily smart contracts, but blockchain for managing transactions and contracts, which connects with other questions that we have here. Unfortunately, we won't have time to go uh, through all of them. We'll try to uh, answer uh, them uh, following up um, uh, after this this panel, and uh, I see that Daniel is is, is back on on the stage with us. Um, Daniel, what's next now? Thank you, Alberto, and thank you all for for finding one hour of your busy calendars to be here with us. I look forward, Matthew, to next year event because. I'm sure we'll have those beers. Next year or this year? <laughs> or this year. No, I think next year, right?